Well, thank you for uh, being here. I hope you find this an interesting talk. And it's short notice to be here. Um, a week ago, I was in Singapore, and the alumni group from Hong Kong flew down. And uh, we were essentially saying, we're starving for software programmers we want to hire. We want to find ways to do research and collaborate. And I grew up in Waterloo, uh, and I did my bachelor's degree here in Waterloo. So I've always known that there's a lot of capabilities in the university and a lot of talent. And I think Canadians are very creative individuals, uh, speaking as one. <laughs> so um, part of the interest I had in coming here was to get to know the university and get to speak with some of the different researchers and, and also meet with the co-op group. So I'll be busy today, but uh, it's a real pleasure that Wise could spend some time and, and put together a quick talk. So thank you. Um, now going into it, the title of this is Post Net Metering Scheme for Renewable Generation. I, mean, I think that most people who've been involved in the renewable sector know what net metering is. Um, the world that we see today, the energy industry that we see today is transforming where we can harvest electricity from our own environments. And one way of developing information uh, to collect data on how much electricity is being generated was called net metering. And net metering has certain advantages that's been um, important for the development of the solar sector. Uh, in my experience, as I started to work further in commercialization of solar technology, I found that there were some shortfalls also from net metering. So Sun Electric in 2013 was founded to promote a new metering system that would help us to get electricity generators set up in Singapore. The company now is working on a few hundred different large-scale factory rooftop uh, power plants. Um, that gives us to the tune of around 60 megawatts of clean electricity in Singapore, which isn't an insignificant number. And some of the technology and business process we've developed through that uh, have also given us a chance to then expand. Um, so we're now working in Tokyo as well uh, as in Manila and uh, Sydney, Australia. So let's get into the talk. Um, this is a very basic overview of net metering. If you want to utilize solar electricity and you're a homeowner, there's a simple system. Well, net metering, what you basically do is internally you can generate solar electricity from your own rooftop. And sometimes when you're not home, the sun shines, there's going to be electricity injected into the network. The idea behind net metering is that you can set up a meter that watches the two-way flow of power in and out of your home. And by doing this, you can then create a policy to treat the energy injected into the electrical network, say, as a, as a subsidy under some for, so form of payment. So uh, a lot of homeowners in Ontario benefit from a net metering scheme. California has benefited. The idea is why would I set up a generator on my roof if I'm giving away free power to the grid? Uh, we need to be paid for the asset that we have on our roof. And so net metering allows you to then inject energy into the grid and get paid. Normally, that payment is at the tariff rate, which is the highest rate, uh, higher than what may be a wholesale spot market rate. And so it's seen as a subsidy scheme. This is a subsidy scheme that allows you to serve your own electricity load. So you're supplying yourself, and then there's some subsidy on top of what is injected into the grid. So it's a little bit different than feed-in tariffs where 100% what you generate is paid for under a tariff scheme. Now, some of the inherent difficulties of net metering have been that under such a scheme, the volume of electricity that is generated isn't really tracked because you don't know how much the user consumes in the home. And you don't know how much power is being generated. Additionally, power networks usually charge for grid fees on a volumetric basis. So under these kinds of schemes, the electrical utility is polarized against renewable energy industry in a sense in that you're, avoid, you're able to then avoid network charges by using these schemes. So there's some conflicts that uh, arise because of these net metering protocols. Um, policy modifications for generation and trade are imposed through subsidy programs. Um, these, moder these modified net metering, and there's limitations on the trade and uptake. 
because of mis mismatch in what is being consumed and generated. What I mean by that is you could go to a lot of different types of buildings where solar would be suitable to put on the roof. In some cases, you'll have 90% injection into the network, and it might make little sense to go and install a generator that is very large. In some sense, the building uses so much electricity that they only get 1% of their power from their own rooftop. So there's a lot of reasons that the commercialization of solar energy under these kinds of protocols becomes quite difficult. And there's a lot of also cases of utilities in different states simply rejecting these protocols. Uh, and I think if you look at the majority of them now, they'd like them to go away because they're too expensive, because the electrical utility is upset, uh, because there's these inherent conflicts of grid avoidance charge. California, Australia, Nevada, um, I have a list of about a dozen case studies we looked at where regulatory policies eventually shifted to trying to oust these types of um, subsidies that originally were very important for bringing clean electricity into the network. One of the largest things that people focus on is the argument that those who can afford a clean energy generator on their own roof to supply themselves are then avoiding the grid network fee. Those who can't afford it then have to go and pay for those community-owned assets. Um, so it's a simple study that we did on the electrical network in Singapore for low-tension customers with and without net metering schemes. We saw that there was a large amount of power uh, sorry, network charges that were then being absorbed by those customers who wouldn't actually put uh, solar generators on their rooftops. And so there's that distortion, economic shifting, and there's an imbalance there that people also um, use to criticize the net metering protocol. So what Sun Electric did was not only did we want to develop a competitive model for power without having to utilize subsidies or strange different ways of metering protocols, we started to look at the net metering scheme and bidirectional metering systems and other alternative ways of commercializing clean electricity uh, in Singapore. One of, the, one of the criticisms of net metering that we have is you're sort of ignoring what's happening behind the main meter of the consumer where the solar panels are. So in a world where we go and track electricity that's generated as well as electricity that goes in and out of a bi-directional meter, we think that we can exploit the, the difference in the um, information systems here to give us a much more favorable system of settling electricity generated in rooftops. So what Sun Electric eventually implemented is what we call the solar wholesale approach. In Singapore, the electricity, is, the electricity market is deregulated. Um, we can trade in the wholesale market. So what we did was we began taking the energy meter inside the building for a solar panel that was installed, say, on your roof. And we would allow the building to sign up simply to say he can sell electricity. We would then settle that electricity directly into the wholesale market. Then by using the information between the meter at the generator embedded in the building and the bi-directional meter installed at the front of the building, we could then compute how much electricity was being consumed by this building. And through this simple mathematical equation, we're just looking at the load itself, and we've separated the rooftop generation of solar from the consumption of electricity in the building. And essentially, we were then able to take this electricity through the market and sell it to any other grid-connected customer. So a very simple example, if we have a consumer with a rooftop solar panel and they have a bi-directional meter connected to an electrical network, if we looked at the variety of cases, we assume that the generator is producing 50 kilowatts, then the load can always be computed by looking at the sum of the energy generated and the energy at the bi-directional meter. So simply, if the load was consuming 100 kilowatts, we would have had nothing injected, and we would have had 50 kilowatts from the solar generated. 50 plus 50 from the grid is 100, which is your total load consumption. If the load was consuming 25 kilowatts, which is less than the solar panels, then we have a case where there's export. We will have measured 25 kilowatts 
exported. On the solar meter, we will have measured 50 kilowatts generated. And simply computing the sum of the two meters, we can then reconstruct the amount of con consumption on the load. So with a very simple uh, addition of these meters, we're able to now free up the, uh, the ability to produce and consume clean electricity. Um, so we'll come back to this in a little bit. Now, if we take a big apartment block as a case study, this given idea, we want to go and aggregate rooftop generators across a city. We may have a very difficult time if we wanted to contract with any of the sub-tenants. The other difficulty of commercialization of this technology is that rooftop solar panels are going to last for 20, 25 years. So we want to trade power for 20 or 25 years. So it's very hard to go to any one tenant and say, please buy 25 years worth of electricity from me. The same case we have when a landlord owns a big shopping mall and his tenant may move in and out of the building, the landlord owns the roof, but the landlord doesn't buy electricity. So it's very difficult to find a way to commercialize solar power in these kinds of situations. In our approach, it's very simple. Because we've taken away the idea that the energy generated is to be supplied to that load, we're simply calculating the total consumption in the building using our meters and settling all of our power through the wholesale market. We can just rent the rooftop, generate power, sell electricity into the network. These customers are billed for their total load consumption on a volumetric basis based on the M plus S equation. And then as an electrical retailer, Sun Electric can then sell the electricity in the wholesale market to any other customer who wants green energy. So eventually what Sun Electric had done was we started setting up a system where we would match rooftops with customers who want clean power. And the buildings sign, signing up for this program, they really love it. Uh, and the customers who don't have rooftops and want clean energy also really love the program. The idea is to treat all of the solar generation as if it's injected into the grid, i.e., we're recording a surplus in the building, but we're selling it into the electrical network. And at the same time, the building, the owner, landlord, are charged for their full gross consumption by accurately accounting for the electricity. And this is um, where we, we introduce the electricity retailer. So what Sun Electric can essentially do is, as a generator, you collect revenue through the wholesale market. And then as a retailer, you can provide the electricity from the generators you own to end users connected to the electrical network. Some of the other advantages of this approach are that in uh, networks with transformers, where we have step up, step down, it allows us to enhance the efficiency of the network. So the, the system is also applicable. If we were to go and look at a case where an industrial building has a step-down transformer at high tension from the grid, serving a low-tension connection in their building, if we were to tap the solar panels onto the low-tension connection, which is the natural voltage of a solar generator, we still record a surplus in the power network at the meter of the solar generator. So the, the meter is recording how much solar electricity is, be, is being generated. And technically then, because the power losses are reduced between transfer of power across this transformer, we're saving a little bit. We're making the system a little bit more efficient. But the actual fact, still the gross load can be billed at the M plus S. That is essentially the actual accounting of how much power is being consumed in that building. Um, so this is also an, adv an advantage. Ultimately, when we began pr promoting this approach in Singapore, one of the biggest advantages we saw was instead of being bound to a commercial model where we would have to sell electricity only to buildings who could sign contracts for 20 years to consume that electricity, we could now set up contracts where the rooftop could simply sign up and that was it allowing the generator to become a tenant in their roof. And the energy customer who didn't have a rooftop could still then purchase the electricity that comes from those generators. And so what it does is it creates a community that can then make a much bigger impact 
The electricity consumption in Singapore is something like 10 times more than the amount of roof space I think that we have to generate power. So this is a much bigger place to go and absorb all that clean energy. Now, when we study this, we did uh, two studies. One is we looked at the effectiveness of um, some of the savings through the network losses. And the secondly, we looked at the money saved by the solar generating utility because of the simplicity of the systems. Because we can connect into the building's electrical networks, but record the power, generate it, and settle it through the pool, we are able to avoid a lot of substations, high tension transformers, step up costs for grid interconnectivity. And it simplifies the procedures for connecting to the transmission network. So we studied the uh, financial savings behind that. We modeled the uh, electric, ele electricity generation profile of solar. We implemented transmission loss factors that were common on Singapore network. And then we modeled that using the wholesale electricity price in the market to go and create uh, estimation on the savings from the avoided transmission losses. Um, doing this, we've used the, the metrological data from Singapore. We've derived the aggregate generation and essentially the um, networks, uh, the transmission networks loss factors were used. And through that, we were um, able to model based on the number of megawatts installed on rooftops, solar power, equivalent annual savings. Uh, sorry, cumulative net present value of uh, over 25 years. So what we find is there's a significant savings um, from this avoided infrastructure costs. So in the many cases where by connecting into the existing low tension network of a building, we've avoided significant costs that would have had to gone into uh, transformers. We've also seen um, some savings through the loss factor on the network due to the localization of current. Um, and it becomes significant as you go and build up. In any given city, it should be reasonable to achieve around 300 or so megawatts of, of solar rooftops. That means something like $56 million of combined savings based on the infrastructure as well as the transmission loss factors. So the savings of implementing this wholesale uh, model is, is significant. So in a summary, um, this post net metering scheme, so to speak, uh, it does resolve a number of different uh, aspects of implementing solar power. One is it removes these grid charge avoidances where people are saying to the electrical network, no, we don't need to pay you uh, anymore because we're generating our own power in our own homes, which polarizes the existing utilities and the renewable energy sector. It also puts solar energy or other renewables on a level playing field against any other form of electricity generation, which is, uh, means that it pushes us to go and find ways to compete in the conventional electricity power sector. Um, it also helps us avoid, avoid higher costs and unnecessary infrastructure because we're implementing information systems which are much cheaper than going and directly connecting to an electrical network. We're able to save millions of dollars in infrastructure. This system is also very safe and simplistic. Um, it actually makes it much simpler to go through the policy for transmission connections because you're usually tapping off of an existing circuit uh, at the same voltage as, as your own power generator. Um, so permitting becomes much simpler. And it opens up the opportunity to install solar panels on a very wide base of potential rooftops because you now can go and sell that electricity to anyone else connected to the electrical network. So that's a bit of a background behind uh, what we did now. Sun Electric is four years old. Uh, we're, luck we're lucky because we're not a, not a startup anymore, <laughs> which means we've survived. Um, the business mission is to go and empower cities to produce and consume solar. And we've gone and used information technology and metering to go and implement. The vision we have is that the future city will harvest electricity from its environment. And one of the big gaps that exists right now is how to go and allow a renewable sector to trade in a conventional world of power. The world of, of electricity has been very dominated by a utility model where usually we look at a network provider who is the one who distributes to end users. And there's generators that large scale almost in a very singular way. Where we are going with renewable is that 
energy will be harvested all over the network. So we have this two-way two -way street now where power is also being produced at the same place that it's being generated. And so the technology Sun Electric uh, has set up is essentially to allow us to go and match make rooftops with cities to other users. Um, our logo here succinctly says what we do. Um, we take sunlight from the rooftops inside a city and by tapping on the electrical network, we transport the electricity to consumers who are connected to the grid. In a quick case, um, here's some of the first generators we set up. These generators, we have three ones that we did with a company called JTC. They're a large uh, industrial estate um, landlord in Singapore. They provided these roof space under a, a rent. The rent itself was pegged to the electricity market rates. So as energy prices rise, they get more rent. If energy prices fall, they get less rent. And this is kind of an idea where they can say, we're selling clean electricity to other consumers. What Sun Electric's done is an electricity um, retailer takes all this electricity and sells it to an electrical customer. So the case study, our consumer here, they're able to log in and track all of their electricity. They have different dedicated generators set up on rooftops connected to the electrical network. And their account tells them how much they're getting. We audit the meters and we audit the electricity generation on those meters for that customer. So here you can see an example. Um, this is a commercial consumer. They leave their office at night. The electricity consumption is falling. During the day, they consume a lot. We gave them a product where we tried to give them almost 100% solar uh, from about 8 in the morning to 6.30 at night during their normal business hours. So you can see that they're almost saturating their account with solar. And that customer is able to achieve almost 50, 52 or 53% solar electricity penetration with our, our system. And this dashboard is a part of the software that we've been writing for smart metering. It allows everyone to go and see where their generation is coming from and who's getting their electricity. Um, this is a quick video to help you sort of understand Sun Electric's business mission. Earth is our home, and we all depend on the sun. With growing populations, our cities have become much bigger. Inevitably, more factories and urban activities mean increased demand for energy and rising global temperatures. One of our most accessible solutions is the sun. Much of the sun's energy goes to waste, especially in cities. What if cities could harvest this energy from the sun and run on that? That is the bright idea which Sun Electric was built upon. Sun Electric created a platform to allow cities to produce and consume solar energy to help transform cities from being just consumers of energy to producers and consumers of sustainable solar power. Right now, rooftops in cities are underutilized. Rooftop owners have the space but not the means to provide the solar energy to consumers in the city. Meanwhile, consumers in the city need energy, but don't own the rooftops which harvest this abundant resource. Here is where Sun Electric can shine light on the problem. We can transform empty rooftops into productive spaces which generate power for the city as well as revenue for the rooftop owners. Sun Electric matches consumers who want solar energy from their city with rooftop owners. So now, anyone can access solar energy that is locally produced. The city also becomes much cleaner. The best part is that Sun Electric makes these energy exchanges simple by placing them on a single platform. We call this smart energy system Solar Space, a solar energy distribution system for smart cities. With this system, rooftop owners and consumers can measure the solar energy that they generate or use. For building owners, all you have to do is tell us your address and leave the rest to us. Then sit back and look forward to the revenue your roof generates from the solar energy you sell to your city's consumers. For consumers who want to buy solar energy, simply contact us for a range of clean energy product packages. We use energy every day of our lives, and Sun Electric's vision is to allow cities to choose energy that is generated locally from the sun. Sun Electric enables cities to produce and consume clean solar electricity seamlessly.
we want our cities to harness the power of the sun. And we're starting from the rooftop. That was the video that we played at the uh, launch when we finalized the first uh, three installations. We had the chairman of the energy market come out. We had about 10 different customers who bought all the electricity. None of them had their own rooftops because they were stuck in big, uh, big skyscraper somewhere. And they were uh, basically able to go in and get uh, the clean energy that they wanted. And the uh, rooftops came from three different parts in the industrial zone of the city. Um, and so that was, um, that was a real great uh, achievement that back in 2015. And since then, we've begun to grow. So I guess this is the part where we ask, well, how does financial technology and, and cryptography come in, uh, and where does, what kind of role can information uh, technology play in this? Well, of course, what we've done is we've worked on uh, information and metering schemes for energy generation. So there's a lot of um, data that we we go and bring into our servers, and that server is essentially there to allow customers to see what they're getting. Um, we're able to do a lot of analytics. We're also able to go and break down different products for customers, depending on how much clean energy they might want to buy from different rooftops. So the last bit of my talk, uh, I'll do a, uh, want to tell you where we went and how we tried to go and implement some integration of um, information tech and cryptographic systems to help certify energy transactions on the network. I think this is a new important trend on where the power sector can also start to go. Well, everyone I think has heard about uh, Bitcoin, if you haven't, so we're all on the same page. Bitcoin is a really um, fascinating um, new currency. Essentially what you had is a coin that could be traded with a, with a certificate. Um, it was cryptographic in nature. And there are a lot of different nodes on a network, so-called hackers, who are breaking the key to make sure that that's a real coin. <clears throat> what you did was then you said, well, we're taking away this central intermediary. We're allowing other people's information systems then to come in and go and validate that these are real, genuine monetary bits. What Sun Electric wanted to do was implement a cryptographic system or maybe even some type of a blockchain so that we could validate the transactions between consumers on the network. And that would allow the customer to know that they're getting clean energy, and it would allow the building to know how much they've generated that they're getting paid for what they've sold. So we started to look into this. We fell short of going and implementing a full blockchain on our system. But where we, and the reason was that we had looked at the number of different nodes that we would have to go integrate into the network. It was a little bit more than we could achieve. So what we did was we started to look at how to encrypt um, information. So uh, in the power market, meters are usually installed by a third party. So one of the things that we, we already wanted to exploit was that certificate for information comes from the source of generation. But the source, i.e. the meter that's measuring electricity, um, is validated to some extent. There's a third party who's locked that meter in a box after it's been calibrated properly. And of course you do that because if you're generating electricity, uh, the market needs to know that someone, someone's gone and, and governed the way that you pay for electricity generated. Um, so how do we went and go to establish transactions between the customer and the generator? Well, essentially, we make a match between the meters of the generators and the consumer's own load accounts. And then we went and decrypt information that we encrypted um, at the source of generation. So um, we can essentially hope that by allowing the consumers to decrypt information, that if they get re real information, that there's no tampering that has been taken place. Now, the only thing we really wanted to do is to allow those customers to know that what we generate and sell is one-to-one. -one. So we also thought we can make a very simplistic hash of the data so that it all boils down to say what we've sold and what we've generated is equivalent. And so that was an idea of telling people this is a new form of carbon credit. It's a certificate. It tells you you're getting clean energy, and you can take it to the tax man. So um, what's what we have on our server, which is running, is essentially um, 
we have a, a system that gives us different products. And we have a cascade where there's high priority and low priority. Essentially what this has is different products for customers. Some customers have a flexible need. They can take a few percent of solar. They don't have demand for a certain amount. Some customers sign up, they want hard guarantees on how much clean energy they're getting. And one of the problems inherent in uh, renewables is that because energy is intermittent, we can't predict how much we're getting. So by creating a priority system, we were able to go and utilize the probability that we could look at the density on how much we're generating and then match make for consumers against a whole bunch of different products. Some people, they'll get 100% blend solar. Even on a rainy day, we can deliver those products. And some people are willing to sign up for an account where they may get a little bit less or more, depending on how much, there, how much sun there was in a given month. Now, information feeds into um, this information architecture. What we have is when we look at the generation and the consumption, we've looked at the probability densities. And our forecasting system sets up allocation tables here. Now, these meters are where the information was certified, so to speak, by a third party. And we encrypt the information at the source. We then compare them against the allocation tables, which matched customers against the solar generator. Just a quick note, the reason we have to do that is you may have a big shopping mall, and you get a lot of solar energy. So of course, you could match that to 20 or 30 or 40 different small homeowners. Um, so we have these allocation tables that keep track of how we've matched different groups of meters. And essentially, um, the data then secured um, through the system allows the consumers to then log in, decrypt, and validate that they're getting the real information that went through the system. So some of the physical architecture here uh, that helps describe it. We're streaming live data directly into our database. Um, and the third, third party meters. And so essentially we have a power generator. Solar is inverted through their electrical inverters. We're plugging into electrical grid, so to speak. And there's a communication system here. We have logic controller. We have a VPN. We log straight in and we broadcast through a 3G network the information from the meters. And so this is going through the, the uh, uh, internet to the server, and the server where we've match made, we have the lists of our allocation tables. So we can decompose the data, the live data against the allocation tables. Um, and I've shown you this. So essentially the consumers can log in, rooftops and customers can go and track that electricity. And then here's a quick shot of, of the customers. Now when they go in, they can log through and they can look into their reporting dashboards. They can pull out their cryptographic certificates here, and what they'll get is validation. Or if we've changed the data, then it would come into, a, I think, a mess of information. So that's how Sun Electric's uh, sort of taken a one step into trying to implement financial technologies or these new cryptographic certification schemes to help us to give the customer some confidence in the ways that we've set up our matchmaking system for rooftops and solar generators. Um, I don't think I've seen that. So that's, uh, that's my talk, and I'm going to give you a quick summary, and then we can go to questions and answers. So to conclude, um, the total potential volume uptake of solar is really enhanced through our program. And that's because rooftops that would have had a real difficulty in signing up under a net metering scheme where they need to be bound by a 20-year purchase of power can suddenly rent their rooftops out. And it's been really dramatic, the amount of rooftops that we get signed up into our program. And I'd say it easily um, order of 10 times more rooftops are coming into this program than before. Um, we can reduce the cost of our in infrastructure by simplifying connection schemes to the grid. We simply use the meters to account for the power generation and consumption. Um, total system-wide losses across the network can be reduced. Of course, that's naturally inherent in distributed generation. Because you have local generation and consumption of power, you have less transmission losses. It's natural. Um, what I think is very interesting is that Sun Electric can now implement this scheme without any forms of subsidies. So it shows you how far 
renewables are coming. It's even in the time of low oil prices, we're uh, working under a, a system where we're really competing in a power market, deregulated market. There's no subsidies in the Singapore market, and Sing uh, Sun Electric makes profits in selling clean electricity there. This system resolves some of the conflicts inherent with the, uh, the wires business. So the utilities who own these wires, they're not now forced to try and push solar out because of those grid, grid avoidance charges. Um, we simply have to pay the network fees because electricity is being transmitted through the network. And if there's systems losses or savings in infrastructure, of course, then that means that the transmission network fees may uh, go down on whole. Um, we've resolved some of the problems with the generation load capacity that happens when you do do building-based PPAs. So if you go to a building, um, they may have too much rooftop space so they can't sign the contract or they may simply not be interested in buying solar from their own roof because their consumption is so high compared to what they can get. Um, I'll jump past some of these points, but essentially, this system that is giving us the ability to track and certify power that is sort of traded between different participants inside the city network. So buildings can get a certificate showing how much clean electricity they've sold off from solar rooftops that they've signed in, and customers connected to the network can then buy clean electricity. But what's also quite important about the implementation of this is later on, as systems are more intelligent, I think our kind of architecture could start looking for correlations, say, between different types of consumers and different types of renewable generation and use smart contracts to then go and, and match make uh, and help customers to then get different kinds of products also um, through using statistics, forecasting, and these kinds of things. Um, so ultimately, I think that it's quite important, a uh, real opportunity to continue in, in the, uh, the race to... Uh, finish line for the renewable world. Um, with that, I'd like to thank WISE again, and uh, we can go and, and answer some, some questions. But again, uh, just to reiterate, I think part of the mission I had to come here was to get to know the university because we're very interested um, to try to work with Waterloo uh, on developing and enhancing uh, some of the systems that Sun Electric's built. Thanks very much. Now, I've been told that you have to talk into the microphone because the video is recording that. You briefly put, is this, uh, is this on? Yeah, maybe not. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you talked briefly about how you have these different products that you sell to your customers that are essentially they're signing up for a certain amount of solar versus other electricity that they'd be getting. I'm just curious about the demand for those different products and what the customers seem to be most interested in and maybe some more about the, the, co the cost of the customer of getting these different amounts of, of solar electricity. Okay. So technically the reason we set these up was that... Um, we can't control how much sun there is or how many clouds there are, so that we can't predict when we get clean electricity. So that, was, that gave us sort of a hard problem to solve, but we, we knew the probability of density of output on a rainy day. So we knew, okay, well, we can actually still guarantee that much power. Um, and so we started to think, well, this is kind of cool because you can create sort of flexible pricing plans depending on the customer's ability to choose if they can deal with that intermittency. Um, so that was sort of the technical reasons we, we went and, and adopted that. Now, to the customer, what we see is um, there's two types, more or less. Um, there's one side who say, we want renewable power. We want 50% you know, of our energy to come from a renewable source. And they're not willing to pay double their electricity rate, but they're willing to pay maybe 10% more. And um, those are the kinds of consumers, more often or not, they're corporate customers. Um, and they think maybe they get some tax advantages and they can raise the flag to say that they're a green energy uh, enthusiast and sustainable. Um, so there's certainly demand for that. And what we've gone and done is we've then allowed those consumers to basically buy a solar blend that should be guaranteed. 
And one of the other parts of, of the benefit then between setting up this flexible system is that we get tons of calls from people who go, I want the best price. And if it's green and the best price, then I think that's a great product. So what we'll offer them is our flex plan. And what the flex plan says is essentially um, you're willing to accept that sometimes there isn't solar electricity on the network for your account. And they simply say, well, that's fine, but I know that I'm going to get 5% or you know, 2 or 3% or if it's really rainy, one month at worst, I won't get any and then the next month I'll get some again. Um, so that's how the pricing and, uh, has come down. Essentially, those are the types of customers we see and their interest in those plans. Um, but I think one of the other benefits that that's given for Sun Electric is because we're selling little bits of solar and we're actually still trading power in an energy market, um, we can attract customers to come and we can make money then through products that have, say, a 1% or 2% solar blend and then um, still make money through these 10 or 10 or 20% solar blend products as well. So what you're getting is people are kind of absorbing that the cost of that infrastructure. Um, and it's not a one-to-one -one sale. It's just a variation on the kind of leverage that you can get out of your assets. Um, so obviously you make much better profit if a whole bunch of people bought 1% solar blends, but you made a margin for 24 hours of their consumption. Um, so, th so that's one of the ways that we've been able to enhance uh, and compete in, in an oil and gas, um, you know, a well, uh, Singapore's market, I think, is 98% supplied through natural gas. And so we're able to compete partially because of that. Cool, thank you. There's one question here. Um, I actually, I think I have a two-part logistics question. Um, how quickly do panels degrade, and when do you sort of decide a rooftop isn't worth the investment to build on? Like, if there's going to be a high-rise next to it in a year, like, what type of logistics come in? Okay. Thanks for the question. So, uh, the typically solar panels today, um, when we buy, so Sun Electric, we don't manufacture, we buy panels from lots of different producers. So the, the range we see is a 25 year, well, the standard we see is a 25 year warranty. Um, and the range in degradation we see is at best 0.6%. And the worst ones we see are about 0.8%. So that's actually quite excellent. On your 25th year, you'll, you'll then be getting some, somewhere between 80 to 87% output as compared to the first year. Um, your next question is really smart. So, of course, when we contract rooftop licenses, we do a lot of due diligence on the building. Uh, and part of that is do the you know, occupants have the interest of tearing it down and some commercial uh, types of due diligence. And part of it also is the planning, the city planning. So a lot of the buildings that we actually will flag for development of solar generators are in the industrial zone where you don't expect to see skyscrapers popping up beside your generators. Um, and so that, that's one of the ways that we deal with that risk. So I've got another logistical question, and, and pardon me for maybe being like ignorant on this, but I, I've been to Singapore, and it's really, really hot, okay? Like people use a lot of electricity just to keep their houses cool. And if a consumer was purchasing green energy and there was a month where they weren't getting it because it wasn't generated and they need the energy because otherwise they're going to fry in their apartment, what happens? Because of the intermittency of the, the generator? Yeah. Okay, good question. So the electrical network is being fed by Generators. So Singapore's market is a, is a whole, the wholesale in market is essentially where power clears. So in an electric, in electricity spot market, in essentially an electricity distributor is allowed to buy from the spot market and sell it to their end users. An electricity generator is allowed to sell into the network. 
So interestingly, all of the power companies in the city hold both licenses. So you sit on both sides of the spot market. Now, the spot market is in, in Singapore, it's cleared every half hour based on supply and demand. Um, and so you've got the capacity of power generators connected at different points in the network. Some of it is uh, waste to energy. As I said, 97 or 98% is natural gas. Uh, fire uh, turbines, synchronous generators. And then there's a large um, amount of solar roofs that are starting to get plugged into that. So what happens if there's lots of, there lots of clouds? Well, there's, there's mainly three scenarios. Um, if the power system operator is going and maintaining the network so that there's a stable frequency on the network, and that means that generation is more or less matches the amount of consumption. Um, if you don't have enough generation, then the turbines are going to decelerate. And you'll have a different frequency and then you'll signal, maybe they'll shut off a circuit. These are the kinds of things they'll do. So a quick answer to the question is that the power system operator would then s essentially say, well, there's a lot of rain and there's still a lot of demand for power. The price is rising. And if you have enough capacity and enough participants in your market, they're just going to burn more natural gas. Um, so that's, that's why. We have a lot of customers who say, well, if I sign up to your plan and it's cloudy, is my air conditioner going to turn off? Well, of course not, because what Sun Electric is, is basically doing is we're feeding power into the supply of the pool um, with all of the other generation on the network, on the elect electricity network. So if the consumer gets an outage, it's either because a circuit shut off, that, that's an infrastructure issue. We don't own the wires ourselves, so we don't affect that. And the, the network there is very high quality. Or it's because of a supply-demand mismatch. Um, in Singapore, I don't think you'll ever get that. There's, I think, two times more capacity connected to the network. In some countries, uh, you have brownouts, blackouts. That's not because of intermittency. <laughs> that's just because there's not enough power generation connected to the network. Um, and so it is an issue, of course, um, not only for the customer who cares about am I getting clean energy or not, but uh, it's obviously an issue to industry and to, to business. Uh, are you getting enough electricity? Um, is there enough capacity? Um, and how do you stabilize the network when you have more and more uncertainty in how much generation there is? When you can burn more fuel, it's very certain. When you're relying on how much sun there is or how much wind there is, suddenly you have to sit down and start studying. So what, what we've been looking at is, well, first of all, can we set up metrolo metrology to look at the neighboring cloud coverage and say, hey, tomorrow it's going to be a full day of sunshine, so you can already bid your market to turn off some of your gas plants. Or you're going to see intermittent cloud cumber floating in and say, well, we need to keep peaking generators on standby. So then you'll have standby charges in your network, in, in your, in your uh, wholesale market. And that'll mean that someone will sit there and that generator will ramp up and down as the clouds pass over the, the solar generators. So th there's a question here, but I want to follow up on this discussion. The obligation to supply rests, of course, on the system operator, right? The obligation to supply. The obligation to meet demand. Yes, the power system operator. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, so it's not on the distribution utility or the generators. So you are just one uh, supplier into the pool, whether and you just supply whatever you have, right? There's no obligation on you to say commit to a certain amount of generation in uh, at at time X in the next hour or so. None of that. Okay. Uh, there's a question here, and then we'll come to you in a moment. And, and, and there are two, a couple of questions here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, very interesting. Uh, and and I'm, I guess I'm interested in your, your thoughts or comments. Um, in, in Ontario, we did not pursue the path of a net metering uh, system. I, 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 you know, we went on a conventional FIT program, um, which, you know, essentially accomplishes a very similar thing in the sense that, um, you know, y y we have four parties to the system. We have uh, generators that can be independent and aggregate generation. Um, we have transmission, which handles the high tension 
uh, capacity and we have distributors which are local utilities that just simply distribute and manage the billing. And then you have the option to go with independent retailers that are licensed to come up with all sorts of uh, individual, uh, li uh, you know, selling or retailing schemes and pricing schemes and, and, and whatnot. Um, so the model that you've described is essentially uh, very similar to a, a solar generator that also has an independent uh, licensing uh, retailing uh, arm to to sign up individual contract or, or individual customers, um, build through the, the you know through the existing channels. Um, so I, I guess you know the. I'm trying to, I guess, understand sort of the merits of uh, switching to that mechanism, at least as it, far, as it pertains to Ontario, uh, because essentially the, the benefit of a FIT system is you sell all your power to the pool. Uh, you have one contracted counterparty, which makes those uh, PPAs essentially bankable. Um, and, and easier and less expensive to finance, and uh, you're not necessarily tying the amount of generation to your, your demand um, because that's sort of managed separately the same way an IESO or a system operator would have. And this, the second part of this question was notwithstanding that structure, which essentially is very similar, um, my personal experience when in Ontario that there was dramatic resistance from the utilities and the distributors, the local utility, to expand uh, and accept even uh, the distributed energy, even though it was injected on the pool. And part of the reasons was was because there were concerns about islanding, there were concerns about uh, feeder capacity and feeder congestion, protection systems at the uh, distribution level, and so there was a, a quite a bit of anxiety about uh, the, who's paying for the cost to upgrade your, your distribution system uh, in order to accommodate um, a material amount of solar on a feeder by feeder basis. And so there's an enormous amount of expenses that were incurred for individual uh, connection impact assessment studies on, you know, even, even 50 kilowatt uh, local rooftop generators. So I, I, I just, throwing that out there as more of a background and I'm curious as to you know your thoughts or your perspective on that given you know your, your innovative approach here in, in Singapore. Thank you. Um, well first uh, <laughs> I guess I could start. sure go ahead. Close to his comment that uh, my question was also because it is like home by home or roof by roof how how much the protection um, upgrading needs because it's probably need bi-directional protection. Uh, so my question was also on the uh, amount of physical infrastructure upgrading and the association of cost and and it's how it reflects to the acceptance of the customers to incorporate of this uh, model. Okay, so cost of infrastructure. So quickly on the feed-in tariff, um, I think the one of the issues with feed-in tariffs are that, yeah, it's an, it's an absolute great way to say, okay, we're going to incentivize one type of generation. So you can say, well, we'll, we'll pay twice as much for solar power um, and we'll, we'll write a PPA so that it's bankable. Um, I guess maybe I'm an entrepreneur, <laughs> but I find that a bit dull. <laughs> and I don't see how that fits well into a tradition or say deregulated power um, market. Um, secondly, feed-in tariffs are, are a little troublesome if you get the pricing wrong because suddenly you're, you know, you're trying to more or less any of the feed-in tariff programs I've, I've seen, they've, they seem to have either priced it too high and then they had, you know, swing towards one direction and then they blow the whistle and they stop paying people or they try and, and push the policies away. So my, my view is that a competitive power market is in the long run, the steady state. And that's why when we set up Sun Electric, we said, if we want this to be scalable, let's forget about the subsidy schemes. I'm not saying that they're bad or good, they serve a certain purpose, but um, the, the majority, uh, the trend that I see is that renewables are getting cheaper and 
energy markets are becoming more deregulated. So it's more likely that we'll end up something like this rather than lots of feed-in tariffs. Um, but I don't know if I have much that I can add on that. But the comments on costs, I've, I've always sort of wondered why the utilities talk about um, the, you know, the, the ways of implementing all these fees, and, and I'm a skeptic. I think if I was a machine, working in a machine shop and I turned off my lathe, I'd probably cause more disturbance to the network than a cloud passing on, on the solar roof above me. And I've, I've done a lot of, of uh, work where you look at consumption and, and supply and demand. And solar, it's, it's going to be tough for solar to put a 10% dent into any city. I mean, one more ambitious, we imagine we could do 20% solar in Singapore, which would be really incredible. And we're nowhere near that. So I don't think that anyone reasonably can say that there's a huge infrastructure over on costs. And, and I, I do think that in some sense there's a little bit of posturing between the utilities who've had, who've sort of had the benefit of collecting billions of dollars of, of electricity revenue. And the question is, well, where is it going to go next? So we, we had the same issue with um, Singapore Power, who owned the electrical network. That, you know, we had a lot of work. We did test bedding sites and we connected to substations. And the end was, you know, shrugged your shoulders and said, it doesn't, it's not going to affect your network. At some point in time, it'll certainly affect supply demand characteristics, but that's when we have thousands of rooftops and we're nowhere near that. So, so I, don't, I don't think there's a lot of justification um, on these different arguments. Yes, you, in some cases, you're going to have, lar you know, a large utility project where there's no substation, transmission lines don't exist. But if you're just tapping off of existing uh, buildings, rooftops, you're, you're probably um, actually improving on I think that's valid. Low penetration levels, it's not an issue. Once you go above 15% at the feeder level, that's when, well, that's, the that's when the issues start. The, yeah. you know, on, on an aggregate basis, you don't get a big penetration, but on localized, whether it's a feeder or whatever, that's where, you know, the, the, the micro safety level uh, assessments need to be done. And a, a good, uh, otherwise you asked about safety. So the generators, um, we have DC and AC surge arresters. The inverters have safety protection. We have MCB breakers on the front. So there's, and, and electrical lightning uh, protection. So there's five la layers of disconnections built into our system where if there was any difficulty, it would simply shut off. My, what I would say is if, if Waterloo has set up assuming one megawatt consumption on an average building and they had 100 kilowatt rooftops, then you would suddenly have oversized your system because <laughs> you'd be generating locally at all those buildings. So the current flows are being reduced because of distributed generation. Um, thank you for your talk. I just wanted to ask about how often is the entity that owns the roof and asking you to place the solar panels on their roof the same entity that's requesting clean energy that's generated through these um, solar panels? And also, if you can, um, this question might be out of confusion. Can you elaborate exactly where does Sun Electric generate the money in this whole process? Um, and is there is a difference between the kilowatt hour that's being generated through the solar panels versus the kilowatt hours generated somewhere else that that's making the difference, or is it just the f the whole process that you guys came up with, which which tackles the problem of having this technology penetrate the the market? Okay. Um, the first question: How often do the rooftops sign up? Um, I guess. Where we are now, um, we're, we're starting to go into a growth phase. One of the biggest projects we have is a major government landlord in Singapore. Um, and we've signed up another three big real estate trusts. In those cases, they've simply said, we'll give you the rooftops. I think one of the real estate trusts has said, just quote our tenants. So we give their tenant a quote every year. 
Um, but otherwise, we're selling the electricity to almost everyone else. So it's very infrequent. But I, I, what I want to say is I, I can't say that that's good data because we're still a young company. So that might change. After we've been around for two years, the landlords might keep calling us saying, hey, can you quote? Um, the second question, how do we make money? So the generators are cleared straight into the wholesale market. So we make the spot rate there. So there is that, that's where the merchant risk is. Um, there's high supply, then power prices drop. There's lower supply, then power prices rise, right? Um, and of course, there's a spread on, on how much you're making above the fuel costs. So um, essentially, that's why the PPA and the feed-in tariff, as, as our friend mentioned, is, is a bit of a benefit. You always know what your price is. Um, now, the other way Sun Electric makes money then, of course, is supplying electricity to customers. So we do generate peak energy. During the daytime, we have a lot of generation on the network. Um, at nighttime, we need to buy electricity from the market because our customers never shut off at night. So they're, by, they're using energy. So we're, we're, of course, then collecting um, on our retail business for 24 hours of consumption. Um, and so we would presumably then price our products so that we make a margin at any at each 20 of those 24 hours. And so when you add up the retail business's margins for selling its green plants, which is something we then need to, of course, trade because it's not 100% solar, as I said, and the generation revenue we make um, through the wholesale supply into the wholesale market, um, we're making, a, I think, a reasonable amount of money. We pay a few cents to the... Um, We've, we pay that one, one or two cents floating rates to the rooftops for rent. Um, I think that it's amazing to me that we can do it competitively in a market. The return on investment we get is really dependent on how well we market our electricity plants. And that's partly why we're really trying to push now into more software systems and information to also help our customers see you know, all the different things they like about they get, their, they get their certificates, they get to see where it comes from and all those things. To wrap up, first to you and then we'll, or maybe do you want to wrap up your thought and then we go to a new question? Sure. Just to what extent uh, do you have the capacity to dispatch your energy if, for instance, the local connections are unable to, you know, use it, there's congestion, or you just simply don't have the unlikely scenario, you have enough customers to take it. I mean, to what extent is that? Uh, On the generation side, we set up um, a dispatching system for uh, curtailment. So if there's a surplus in negative energy prices or you're being told to shut down, we, uh, we can't. Um, where we're starting to work now is on demand side management. And we think that we could come up with a new product uh, to help optimize energy consumption on the load side. And that might help us go and get around this patch. But basically, um, we don't need the dispatch. With solar, we can clear everything in the market. We did build a system in. Uh, I think I showed you guys that picture. Here it is. So we can communicate with our systems, the inverters, and we can signal to sh set the inverters at any different output we want. So if we want to curtail, we can. We do not have any battery storage. Right now, I think it's unnecessary to go and store the power. It, dri it doubles your cost. The batteries are going to break. You're going to have to re replace that every five or 10 years. Um, so we can't really just do any kind of dispatch. We can just do curtailment. Um, thank you very much for talking to us today. Um, I was wondering why you chose Singapore as your target mar initial target market, um, and what exactly would have to change in Canada to make this model work here? Is it infrastructure? Is it policy? Um, yeah. Okay, um, I'm, Singapore is my home. <laughs> People in Singapore ask me that. It's like, well, I've been there for 10 years. I can't leave now. Uh, I, I, went, I, I actually graduated from Waterloo. I worked in Kitchener for two years, and I got a scholarship offer, and, and I got really excited. So in Singapore, I've, grad I've gone through um, the, my, my PhD, and when I came out, I started doing these rooftop things. Worked a lot with the government there, and I start, thought of it as my home. 
it is a place where you get good government grant support. So we, we did get a, some money to help us kick off the business. So that was really great. But uh, I think the next view is to start growing out from Singapore. So I can't tell you I specifically chose Singapore for any reason. Um, and uh, Ontario, uh, I don't, I actually need to sit down and study the market, but you might know. Can I get a retail license here? Yep. And actively they did that to us in Singapore too. It's it just takes a lot of work. Yeah. So it, I think that you do need to see um, you need to see a liberalized wholesale spot market for power if if you want to, to get you know a competitive place to clear electricity to have the flexibility. Otherwise, everything's paper, bi-directional, uh, and it's not, it's not easy to, to just see what is the supply demand of the market, how can you hedge your contracts, how can you finance. Um, so I think that's, that's a key part. And then secondly, liberalization of uh, distribution and retail. To me, you know, when, when the 1920s rolled in and elect everyone got electricity, the state went and made a bargain, they said, We'll give the utilities these monopolies, um, but they have to serve everyone who knocks on the door. And nowadays, it seems like a pretty good bargain, right? I mean, everyone who comes has to be billed by you. <laughs> but uh, I, don't, I don't think it's the, um, ne necessary to have those uh, monopolies anymore. I do think that the wires business is, is naturally going to be in mono uh, some form of monopoly. It's hard to break up a franchise say, oh, he wants to run wires at, down the same road. I mean, you might as well have one utility who owns the infrastructure. But the meters don't need to be held by the utilities. And the utilities put up a good fight to argue that, you know, it doesn't matter who does the collections or billing. But it absolutely makes a difference. I mean, we can come in and create crazy types of products. People might choose to buy that the utility under a regulated tariff simply can't offer. So there's a lot of creative things you can do in a power sector that you need to have a certain amount of deregulation on the retail side and in the information side. Um, so the components of, of the market that I look at are transmission. I don't think we're going to go and look at a world where there's uh, deregulation of transmission networks. Generation, almost everywhere you've got some form of deregulation in the generation side. Is it gone and done through an ISO into a competitively cleared spot market? I don't know. Um, retail, i.e., I can buy and hedge and sell and collect for power in the power market. You don't have that in a lot of places. I think 50 or 60% of USA, Canada, the utility gets to do that still. There's no need for that. And then finally, the information systems. Um, there's no, there's no reason that the guy who owns the wires has to own the meters. You can simply give a license for the information system to a, a, a separate entity. And I think that's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, Ontario needs to look at as, as well. Any further questions? Uh, if not, uh, Matthew, uh, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Our privilege. Thank you. Very much. Uh, it was wonderful. Thank you.